Hey guys, welcome to this session by IntelliPath. Currently, the Linux kernel has 20 million lines of code and this is the smallest it has ever been. And Linux is one of the biggest open source projects in the world. And you would have come across this programming language quite often, which is the C programming language. And 95% of Linux is written using C. Also guys, before moving on with this session, please subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss our upcoming videos. Now let us take a quick glance at the agenda. To start off with, we'll learn what is Linux and about its kernel. After that, we'll look at the basic Linux commands. Moving on, we'll look into files, editors and file permissions. After that, we'll look at shell scripting and also looping and conditional statements. Moving on, we'll look at more advanced Linux commands. And finally, we'll look into networking in Linux. Also guys, if you want to do an end-to-end -end certification training on Linux, IntelliPad provides a complete Linux certification training and those details are available in the description. Now without any further delays, let us begin with this session. So first let us get started with introduction to Linux. Linux is a Unix-like operating system developed by Linus Torvalds and thousands of open source contributors. So what does Unix-like operating system mean? So there was this Unix operating system even before Linux was existing. After that, Linus Torvalds came up with an idea of creating an open source distribution of Unix, which is now called as Linux. But right now, Linux is more popular than Unix, but the base of any Linux operating system is Unix because it follows the same architecture of shell and kernel and other applications. So now, Linus Torvalds is the main contributor for this large open source project Linux, but there are other contributor, uh, contributors as well. Linus Torvalds started off this project, but later on, as this is an open source project, anyone could contribute to it. So like that, there were 11,413 different changes by individual contributors. Um, so this was after version 2.6. Before that, still there were a lot of contributions. After that, there were again a large number of contributions, even from companies like Red Hat. Red Hat is one of uh, the most popular uh, Linux distribution company. So Linux operating system distribution company, they have both community versions and they have paid versions. So Intel is there, Novel is there, IBM is there. There are a lot of companies and they have all made contributions to the kernel. Moving on, so Linux is an operating system. It is reliable and secure than other operating systems. Also, it is completely open source. So open source in the sense you can take the basic Linux operating system and create your own operating system out of it. Repeat. So, so it is completely open source. This basically means you can take the basic Linux, oper Linux operating system, uh, Linux operating system structure and create your own operating system using that. So it was launched by Linux Torvalds in the year 1991 on 17th September. So it is reliable and secure than others. This comparison we'll do right now because right now I am using an Windows operating system to show you this particular presentation. So the most common usage of any operating system is obviously Windows because it comes inbuilt in a lot of uh, laptops, a lot of PCs and a lot of CPUs because L Windows is the most popular, the most easier uh, operating system and also uh, it has a name for it for personal computers because you can play a lot of games in that linux is not that much compatible with games but coming to the it sector coming to the development part linux is preferred than windows okay guys a quick info if you want to do an end-to-end -end linux training intellipad provides a complete linux certification training and those details are available in the description so one more reason for learning Linux is Linux is everywhere. So any operating system you take will have some kind of a Linux system within that. So even in Windows, you have command prompt. In Mac OS, again, you have terminal. Even in other Linux GUIs currently like CentOS, CentOS uh, Red Hat GUI, then there is Ubuntu GUI. In all of those graphical user interfaces, still you have terminal 
uh, emulators. So normally a Linux system might be a command line interface, but right now you have GUI based Linux operating systems as well. But currently you might have a phone in your hand. You might be watching this video in your phone or your phone might be on your table, but every one of your family member right now will have a smartphone, maybe not. But right now, any smartphone which is running Android on it has Linux running on it because the Android operating system is built using Linux principles. It's built on Linux. The Android, uh, sorry, the Android operating system is basically Linux. And you can see 85% of all smartphones are based on Linux. That means uh, there are iPhones, there are Windows uh, operating system phones, there are uh, other operating systems, which are again a subset of Android, which comes under Linux. And this is one of the reason. Second reason is your car uses Linux, especially self-driving cars, not just uh, self-driving cars. There are cars with uh, inbuilt uh, interfaces, which have multiple uh, uh, operations. You can basically click on a button and the window wiper will start. So these structures, uh, sorry, these algorithms or these, uh, these microcontroller systems are again running in Linux. Even self-driving cars need Linux to run on them. So why? Because Linux is faster, uh, it's secure, it's reliable than other operating systems. And one more, again, refrigerators also have Linux running in them. So, okay, so coming to why Linux is so popular, and you can, I, I would have told you cars use Linux, your smartphones are on Linux, uh, even your refrigerators use Linux. There are so many other possibilities, your micro microwave ovens, and there are so many devices which might be using Linux. So now let us look at the supercomputers. So uh, you might be thinking, okay, so they are on Linux, but why not Windows? Why shouldn't I keep Windows and use the Windows operating system to do all that? So here comes the fact. So you can see here that, sorry. So you can see here uh, before 2003 or 2004, Unix was dominating the supercomputer market and even there was some BSD, there was some uh, Mac operating systems, there was some uh, Windows operating systems running on supercomputers. But right now in 2020, the top 500 supercomputers existing in the world are running on Linux operating system. You can see the entire market is right now captured by Linux. So why all supercomputers need Linux is because Linux is lightweight, Linux is fast, Linux is secure, Linux is reliable. So coming to the fact, so if supercomputers are running Linux and they are successful using Linux, why not your PC? Why not your uh, desktop? So basically it's not a bad practice to use all other operating systems, but uh, coming to the development part, uh, Linux is more preferred by developers. It's not my personal opinion, but Linux is more preferred by developers. But if you're building an application uh, on the .NET framework, obviously you need Windows or you can emulate it on uh, Linux operating system as well. You can run, run a Windows virtual machine on Linux. So choosing an operating system is uh, uh, your wish. It's for what kind of a need you need that operating system. But right now we have come to learn Linux. Let us look at more uh, more data about this Linux. So right now let's compare between Windows and Linux. So this is one of the main questions asked. Uh, what is the difference between Windows and Linux? So this you should understand very well. First, Windows Server, you need to purchase the license. Windows is not free. Windows is not open source. If you're running Windows, so if I'm running Windows currently, my Windows should be licensed. My Windows is licensed. If it is not licensed, that means you're, uh, it's a pirated version of that operating system. Next, Linux is free. It is uh, open source operating system. There are paid operating systems as well in Linux, but uh, so CentOS is free. Ubuntu is free, so you can download them and install them for free. And then not many customization options uh, because like Windows releases a uh, few operating systems in few years, like let's say right now we have Windows 10, maybe in a couple of years or the next year we might get a Windows 11 or 12, uh, but you cannot customize it a lot. But in Linux, there are so many different distributions, even uh, let's say Ubuntu, there are so many different versions in Ubuntu, then there is CentOS, then there is Fedora. 
that we'll look at uh, later we look at the various distributions but this is what is available there are so many linux distributions and you can choose one according to your needs and then windows is vulnerable to viruses and malware threats a powerful antivirus software is a need so in windows without an antivirus software if you are trying to download something from the internet i'm pretty sure you will catch up a malware in your system because windows operating system is uh, quite weak in the security aspect uh, it still has windows defender but still windows defender is not equal to a full-time dedicated antivirus software which basically watches uh, all the time for uh, malwares it detects and tries to delete it so that's why windows is a no-no for uh, downloading things without antivirus but in in basically in linux uh, it's more secure than windows and the kernel is built as such viruses cannot be easily broken so for a hacker to uh, create a code which will uh, break the linux system it takes a lot of practice the code should be very efficient so that it breaks the linux system so these are the differences between windows and linux and before windows was ms dos which was again a command line interface and then there is uh, linux again it was a command line interface but then later on uh, operating systems got evolved windows got its gui now right now linux also has its gui there are various types of guis so now let us look at the different linux distributions you can go for coming here now you can see debian you can see fedora you can see ubuntu you can see CentOS, you can see Red Hat, and you can see SUSE. So there are still a lot of Linux distributions, but I'm just uh, putting up some popular uh, distributions, you know, Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu, and all. So CentOS is the operating system which we are going to use throughout this Linux course. So we'll not be using any other uh, operating systems. We'll be using CentOS. CentOS is basically the community version of the Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And CentOS has all the features of any other Linux uh, uh, distribution. There is also Kali Linux. There is, there is so many varieties. There is so many distributions in Linux. So you will have to go ahead and check for what exact purpose is this particular distribution better for and choose your Linux distribution accordingly. But most probably except the package managers, um, the commands, the Linux, basic Linux commands, the basic Unix commands are going to be the same in every single Linux distribution so that it's pretty easy to move from one distribution to another. So basically, if I'm currently working on CentOS, I can easily adapt to Ubuntu. So it's like that. So this is the introduction to Linux. Okay, guys, a quick info. If you want to do an end-to-end -end Linux training, Intellipad provides a complete Linux certification training and those details are available in the description. Basics of shell. Now let's get into it. So first, we'll be looking at the Linux architecture. So Linux architecture in the sense, it is not uh, an architecture which is uh, built using hardware. So the hardware part is what you mean by the laptop's uh, hardware or the CPU. So that is the middle part over here, hardware. So hardware just cannot contact with the users directly. So let's say if you just uh, have a motherboard laying on your table, you cannot uh, communicate with it. A motherboard or a microprocessor or anything, a complete setup is there and you cannot basically you cannot communicate with it because there is no common language between you and that CPU. So to uh, enable that there comes kernel which is the middleman which basically contacts the hardware for us. So we are the users. We try to utilize few utilities or few applications so let's consider the application is a calculator so the calculator as using the calculator you want to do arithmetic operations so now let's say this is the calculator you are trying to use that application so now the calculator will uh, basically this is the application so there are a few commands within the so there are some commands within the linux and those commands are executed on an entity called the shell so we'll see what is shell but right now let's consider the 
architecture so you have the applications and you have this shell after that shell basically executes your commands for you it will basically communicate with the kernel for you so as an end user you see the shell you type in a command or you type in uh, something or you just click on an application the first instruction will be given to the shell so the shell gets it so let's say you want to copy a file so you use the copy command so shell knows that you are using a copy command and you are trying to copy a file to another file so now this instructs the shell instructs the kernel basically it interprets the command and it instructs the kernel to do this particular operation so kernel will understand what exactly is the operation and it will push that to the hardware which in a language which the hardware can understand so an assembly level language or something like that or a microcontroller language so it sends it to the hardware so the hardware will do you do the operations for you send it back to the shell which where you can view that so as a user you just know you've typed in the command but you do not know what happens inside and what comes back so you type in a copy command and you get the results in a fraction of a second and you don't see what exactly happens behind so you only see the monitor where you type in the command you are typing the command on the shell which is an interpreter for the kernel so the kernel gets the command and knows what to do and it does those operation with the help of hardware and then sends it back to the kernel and which is visible on your shell which you can see and understand that the operation has successfully happened or if there is an error you can see the error too so this is the linux architecture so moving on we'll first have to understand what is shell so a shell interprets the commands you have entered using a keyboard and sends it to the operating system to perform them so as we have discussed the linux architecture you have the shell and then you have the kernel so both these entities shell and kernel or programs which are running on the operating system the operating system is what making the shell and kernel possible so kernel is uh, trying to communicate with the hardware shell is the interface between the kernel and the user so now what shell does is it interprets the commands which as an user you give it into the system using the keyboard or the mouse so shell interprets that it understands what you're trying to say and it translates it and sends it to the operating system operating system in the sense the kernel so it sends it to the kernel kernel now understands what exactly should be happened it uses the hardware help to complete those operations and once it is done it sends it back to the shell so that you can view it on your monitor so the basic explanation of shell is this you need to understand this uh, only then you can go ahead with your uh, linux training so we understood what exactly is shell moving ahead so nowadays yeah there is a lot of graphical user interface based linux systems so even centos is a graphical user interface based system there is also a centos server which is a command line interface but there is also a graphical user interface so like centos there is ubuntu there is red hat there is debian and there is Kali Linux. There is a lot of Linux distributions which have GUIs. So in a graphical operating system, how can you uh, basically communicate with the kernel with the use of a shell? So to emulate the purpose of a server to emulate the purpose of the command line interface all the GUI based Linux distributions have a terminal within them a terminal is basically an emulator or a duplicate of a command line interface so if you click on this terminal I think most of you would have seen this at least once if you open the terminal in your GUI based Linux system you will see a terminal like this so there you will have your username at localhost or any name uh, any of your systems name can be given here and then you have this dollar symbol and here you will have to enter your commands so you can see i have entered the command called pwd which means present working directory this shows the present working directory and currently the directory is slash home slash intellipad so it's in the directory intellipad so that's what it's showing over here so this is the emulated version of a command line interface so you can see here a terminal which we see in the gui server emulates a command line interface linux server terminal emulators are more commonly used now due to GUI operating systems like Mac or Windows or Ubuntu. So even in Windows we have a command prompt, even in Mac we have a terminal, even in Ubuntu or Cent we have a terminal which emulates or duplicates the purpose of a command line interface server. So now coming to top shells, we saw what is a shell and how does a 
emulator of a shell looks like in a GUI based system. Now we'll be looking at the top shells in Linux. So there is not just one Linux. As I told you, Linux is an open source system. So obviously there are a lot of contributors who create different types of shells. So the most common, the most, uh, so basically a default uh, shell you can say is bash. B-A-S-H that is bash the name the elaboration of bash is born again shell is a default shell in a lot of linux distributions so born again shell is the default one even in centos and even in uh, pure ubuntu in a lot of different linux distributions bash is the uh, default one you can further install other shells also it is uh, your wish and then there is a uh, zh uh, which is basically z shell and it is similar to bash or an extended version of it so basically as i told you they take uh, the linux operating system and create another linux operating system which has better features so like that they they took bash and made it better or added few features like um, sharing your command history across multiple terminals so let's say there are four different users using the same uh, linux operating system in different usernames so you can share your command history to another user so this is one of the features there are so many useful features in uh, z shell this is one of the useful features in z shell so that's what i wanted to share with you so going ahead there is fish friendly and interactive shell so it is again an extended version of the common shell which is bash so it has great features like auto completion of commands so fish is an amazing shell so fish has this ability to auto complete your command so let's say you're typing in grep and uh, your command is going on going on so you don't want you do not want to type all of that so if there is a command grep if you just type gr and hit tab you will get it auto completed so it is like a IntelliSense, so it is like an IDE with IntelliSense, so you can use Fish for that. And then TZSH, the next C shell is an extended version of C shell. So there is another sh uh, shell, basically CSH or the C shell. Basically, the C shell is written mostly on the C programming language. That is why it is called as uh, C shell. And TCSH is again an extended version of the C shell. Uh, they've taken C shell and added uh, more capabilities to it. So the plus of TCSH it's, is a uh, scripting language because it will be similar for the users who already have experience in C programming. So that's the benefit of TCSH. Uh, if you already have a good experience with C programming, if you know how to write uh, code in in C programming so then you will find shell scripting pretty easy in TCSH because it might have the same method of uh, writing so that's what they're uh, telling over here there are still so many shells you can just do a simple Google search and get to know about more mul uh, multiple shells but these are the top shells and these are the most popular shells so that's why I'm showing them here so going ahead so that's this is the command which I executed in the previous uh, uh, previous window which I showed you while showing the GUI based terminals so a simple command to interact with the shell this command below provides the present working directory so I wanted to show you an example of how you interact with the shell so basically if you type in PWD and uh, you are interacting with the shell when you hit enter the shell understands that you are entering in, in a command first it validates the command whether this particular command is valid in this Linux distribution PWD is a valid command then it further pushes it into kernel kernel gets it in and pushes basically executes the command with the help of the hardware provided and then it gives back the result to the shell and shell displays it to you so that you can view it so this is one of the example which i wanted to show you the kernel okay so first a linux kernel is a unix like operating system kernel so again as linux is a unix like operating system obviously the kernel of linux will be a unix like kernel so it is a computer program which is the core interface which connects the hardware components to the software processes so the software processes which you are trying to establish or trying to uh, interpret is uh, basically you are typing in the command on the shell and hitting enter so uh, you will know this part basically you will know the application part where you are typing in the command and then you do not know what happens in the back it just you get the result so what happens is whenever you type in a command you have the kernel in the middle a kernel is basically a very huge program very uh, it's a very huge program right now i think it's uh, standing up at 2 million lines of code so it is a very complicated program and 
so a kernel as it's complicated it is also that helpful so a kernel is the main um, in interconnection between the software application or the software processes and the hardware components so let's say if you're trying to find out how much uh, ram your system is currently using so you cannot directly go and check the ram in your system you need a process running in the background which basically connects to the hardware components and checks how much ram is being used and sends that information back to you so that is what the kernel does so kernel does all kinds of operations that we'll see now so the top operations performed by a kernel first resource management and then memory management and then device management and finally system calls okay now let us get a brief about each of those operations first resource management so kernel decides which process gets a resource for an operation so let's say you are running multiple processes parallelly say in that multiple processes two processes need the same resource for an operation so right now the kernel will decide which operation should use that resource first or which should use it second because it should not end up in a deadlock situation so to avoid that kernel performs an operation which basically chooses which exactly needs the resource right now or it may delay the uh, process of execution so it might give it to a process which takes lesser time first and then it gives it to a process which takes a longer time so the resource management there are varieties but this is one of the main operations which the kernel does second one is memory management memory management uh, is very important for any server for any computer even in your windows system uh, you have 1 tb of space and even then memory management is very important because memory management is taken care by your system your operating system windows and it takes care of it well so like that kernel takes care of memory management as well kernel has complete access to the system memory and must efficiently manage it and allow memory access to process so why do you need memory exactly is uh, memory is not for storing uh, content memory is to run processes efficiently and effectively so the kernel should know how much memory should be allocated to each processes so that your system is not completely taken away of uh, free memory so let's say you have 100 mb of memory and there are 10 processes your kernel should decide how much memory does each process deserve to use so it should provide that efficiently and the device management So device management it's uh, pretty common in every single operating system so basically if you're using a windows system if you just enter a pen drive you'll be seeing that in your uh, my computer or this pc software so like that device management is also taken care by kernel so if we connect devices uh, as a printer or a pen drive so the kernel will detect it and the system will establish connections with the peripherals so if i connect in a pen drive so this particular system my operating system should detect whether i have connected a pen drive or not if it does not detect then there is no use of a usb port in your computer so the kernel will detect it and there is a separate directory in kernel which is known as uh, slash /dev dev so that particular uh, directory is especially maintained for device management so any device uh, entering into this particular linux operating system or any linux operating system will have a separate directory for them in the div so if i enter a pen drive that pen drive will have a separate directory within that slash /dev directory so linux kernel also takes care of device management and finally system calls system calls uh, this is one of the important concepts and this is an interface between a process and the operating system when the process does not have permissions to access a resource a system call provides it without the process accessing the resource directly so basically let's say you are running a process but you've not given the process enough permissions to use a particular resource so you can use system calls for that process you can embed system calls in your shell script or in your code so that when that particular system call is used your process will be given access to that resource indirectly using system calls so that is the purpose of system calls itself to not stop the process from running it does not interrupt your uh, execution it helps your execution to complete as fast as possible for that you can use system calls and also you can use system calls to basically do more operations on the operating system level so let's say you want to 
uh, abort a particular process immediately you can use a sig system call for that so there are various system calls uh, these are the four important operations performed by a kernel so we'll be saying uh, this later in this course so you will have to just assume that kernel is the you don't need to assume actually you'll have to understand that kernel is the main component of any linux distribution and kernel manages all of the top operations of a linux distribution so right now i think we can get started with linux itself so first we'll be looking at some basic linux commands so that we can get started with linux easily so to these are for understanding how exactly linux works so first we'll look at some basic commands so moving ahead okay so first we'll look at these commands command and ta their tasks so pwd uh, shows the present working directory who am I shows the username date shows the date and time and then so there are still more commands who make directory cat move so now let us start from the first pwd and try executing these so um let me open so I have my virtual machine opened so I've opened it so once it's open we can uh, start off with the process I'll open terminal terminal as I told you terminals are emulating shells they are emulators of shells where you can type in commands and it works like a command line interface so so let's get started with that so once it comes yeah so now I'll open terminal so just I'll just click here okay so send it's running and yeah so first was pwd if i type this in you can see slash home slash intellipad so you can see that over here so this is my present working directory so under intellipad right now i'm working uh so that's why i'm just showing it as the present working directory so let's say i go back and now if i do a pwd it shows home because i'm in the home directory so that's how this works that's how pwd works and it's one of the important commands you'll have to remember it's pretty simple so let's say you have navigated into multiple uh, directories you exactly do not know where so you can just do a pwd and check that for yourself now next one is who am i so who am i is again a simple command but it shows you which in username have you used to log in so let's say you have five different users now you can basically uh, you can log into this particular CentOS system from multiple users as multiple users so if you might have forgot which user you are using as you can just type in this command and it will give you the username and then and then uh, there is date history so again I'm going to type in date it shows you the date the Friday January 31 and it shows the time and it shows the year okay so we've seen that so this is Eastern Standard Time so that's what it's showing so next um, we have history we'll see history later then we have copy we have remove, we have clear, man, exit, and cat, move, alias, echo, ls. So echo we'll see later, ls we'll see later because we'll do these commands uh, in detail. We'll learn about these commands in detail. Right now I'll just start off with the basic commands so first. So let me clear this. So right now you have cleared it and you don't know, you want to uh, see what and all commands you have used still so that you can take out the command and use it again. So for that you have this command called history. Once you type in history, you can see all the commands which you have executed previously. So you have history, clear, date, who am I, and PWD, PWD, and these were previously entered. So it also shows the previous history. So this is why you need history. If you would have forgot any command, you can just type in history and copy that and paste it within this. And so let's say I have forgotten this. So I'll just copy this and paste it over here. So this is what history. And then one more thing is touch touch and one dot txt so the file got created but it won't open so you can see the file got created over there so now there are uh, various text editors we'll learn about text editors as well so right now i'll just open it nano dot txt and hello world to save it is control o enter control x so i've saved the file and the file is ready right now so let's say i want to see the contents of the file without opening the file so how can you do that so it's pretty simple you can use the command cat cat and type in the file name so cat1.txt and you can see the typed in the files uh, contents over here so this is why you can use cat and another thing so let me create another file 2.txt and right now you have a 1.txt and a 2.txt file so you want to copy the contents of 1.txt to 2.txt you use the copy command which is cp then source and destination so once you've entered so now if i do a cat or 2.txt 
txt you can see hello world inside that i did not open those files i just used the command cp which copied the contents of the first file into the second file so you can use this also you can do one more thing that is move 1.txt to 3.txt so right now there is a 3.txt file but there is no 1.txt file because i moved the contents of uh, 1.txt as well as the file i moved it into 3.txt so right now if i do a cat of the file 3.txt you will see the same content inside that again i can move it back by using this command so this is the move command you can basically move file within a directory or uh, you can also move file outside of a directory so let's say move 1.txt slash home uh, slash 1.txt so i want to move it to a file which is not in this directory so it's showing permission denied cannot move so let me add a sudo in front and check so i've given the permission so now you can see here the 1.txt file is not there so going back so i'm in the home directory and here you can see the 1.txt file and if i do a cat it should have the same content because i just moved the file here i did not uh, just move the file also i moved the contents of that file so guys we've seen the basic linux commands which are needed to uh, start with linux any linux distribution those commands are the same so right now we are going to see another command which is called echo and it is one of the most important commands which you have to know so moving ahead so first what exactly is echo echo is used to display a line of text or a string by passing it as an argument so now you can see this example over here echo intellipad it basically printed that over here so again you can see over here echo so sorry for that again you can see over here echo display text display line of text so this is what it does displays a line of text and there are some descriptions uh trailing new line uh, so these are some examples which we'll be uh, doing so right now just remember this uh, it is basically a command to display a line of text or string so now there are some options uh, you can use these options while using echo so echo and if you use a minus n it gives you the output without a new line it adds that particular or uh, sorry it adds that particular option to the same line itself so first so let me clear this just a second an option to so i'll just make it huge so that it's clearly visible okay so right now i've zoomed in so guys uh i wanted to share echo so echo uh hello so you can see it has printed hello so echo hello world how are you it can also print a complete line and then so you if you do this hello minus n so as i told you it will not use a new line it prints with the uh command line itself so this is one option of echo then another option is minus e this will allow usage of back backslash escapes so there are some backslash escapes uh, there is uh, b there's n t b so b removes the space between text and n prints the text in a new line then does a horizontal tab does a vertical tab so let us execute these one by one so first let me do this so if i type hello slash so i'm using slash b so i don't want space between these two uh, lines but if i do this it won't work because slash b is not escaped over here so coming back here and also i've typed it in wrong so even though if i've typed in the slash correctly so again you can see the slash is not there but b has been added so to escape this you can use the option minus e hello b world so i think i'm doing another mistake so the thing is i think we'll try with quotes yeah so that's what uh slash b basically again i did not put in quotes so it uh, thought that that is again a part of the string itself so right now i've used minus e to escape the particular option that is uh, backslash b so now hello world in between that i used uh, slash b and it removed the space between hello world now one more thing is minus slash n slash n separates the words and prints them in separate lines so let's say hello world how how are you so you can see that hello world how are you so hello is in one line and after that i have a new line world how is in one line then after that i have a new line then are you so this is one and then you have two most commonly used ones which are slash h and slash t so slash t does a, a basically a horizontal tab slash uh, so you can see here slash t does a horizontal tab slash v does a vertical tab so going here slash v 
and now you can see that horizontal tab it left in eight spaces or a tab between hello and world and horizontal vertical tab is basically a new line but it will be on the same line but it will be an, a line different so let's see them with both and now now these are slash t's now let's see both of them with slash v's and now you can see the difference so here when we did hello world are you here we used a slash t and here we used a slash v but right now i'm using in both the places i'm using slash v basically they'll be in the same position as the same line but they will be a line apart so this is how you use these options so now i've also added some examples over here the same kind of examples how are you and uh, slash v slash t slash b all these examples and one more thing i wanted to show is you can do this with echo so now x i'm putting in a variable and i'm just giving it some random number so now if i do a dollar x you can print the variable so this is one of the most useful uh, things about echo now again going back and you can do one more thing like if you do an ls so you see all the subdirectories of that particular directory you can also do that with echo tar so you can see them but they will not be displayed in a colorful manner ls actually differentiates between directories and files but echo cannot do that it just prints what are the contents of that particular directory going back what are the examples yeah there is one more example for expression so let's say i have already entered the value for uh, x let me enter a value for y yeah so now echo dollar so this is a format so now x and plus so let me try this if it works then it's fine yeah so it's 79 so it has added 23 and 56 so the problem is if you do this dollar x plus dollar y it will not print it it just prints the content of x separately and y separately but to do an arithmetic operation you will have to put dollar in the front and two parentheses and in between you will have to write in the arithmetic operation so let's say you want to subtract them then you can go ahead and do it like this so this is how you use the echo command and these are the basic examples of it so we've done the hands-on for echo command so we've seen echo and other basic linux commands now we are going to see set and unset so set again is a command but there are various types of uh, doing it there are various commands to set a variable and there is this unset command so if you have set already a variable as a global variable or a local variable you can use the unset command to remove that so now let's get started first we learn what is set and unset so first the set command is a built-in function in bash and few other cells which you can use to define the values of system variables set is not required to set a variable there are various ways to do it so as i told you set is the command so in the back end that is the command which will run so i did x is equal to a number in the last session for do, uh, doing an echo of it so when i did that it automatically took it as a variable so that particular operation is a set operation set need not to be a command to be used but that is the operation which happens whenever you are trying to give a variable a value so you can use the command export to create environment variables so while you create environment variables you are using the command export basically again that is a set operation export is another command to set environment variables even though setting environment variables and variables are similar the only difference is environment variables are for the complete system come globally it is available but normally setting a variable like is equal to 23 are local uh, are locally available they are local variables and finally the unset command the unset command is a built-in function in bash which you can use to remove a variable which is set so if you have already set a variable using export then you can use the unset command to remove them so going ahead we'll see some options the first option is minus b notify of job termination immediately second one is minus e exit immediately if a command exits with a non-zero status then third one is job control will be enabled and fourth option is pretty uh, good so all export these are basically other options you can see these options over here you can use the set command to turn off or on particular functions so all export in the sense if you have not enabled this then you cannot use the export command if you have enabled this then you can use the export command so we'll see some examples first so you can see hello one echo hello this is what we did in the last session so this is done this is for local variable and this again the same thing this is a global variable and and yeah 
echo dollar hello one echo dollar x unset hello uh, echo dollar hello dollar x it's only printing the value of x not hello because we uh, removed that variable and then again here hello one export hello we have made hello into a global variable so echo hello is showing again we are going entering another bash and under the bash we are trying to do that but again we are getting the value but in this particular example you can see we entered another shell but under that shell you cannot see the value of hello because it's a local variable when you use export it becomes a global variable so now the, this is one way of making a variable global and there is another way which is export x is equal to 2 instead of providing hello equal to 1 then export hello you just put export hello equal to 1 so that will be more than enough and then you can see this set plus o this is where set command comes in so you can basically stop or start particular operations in your system so if you have installed so there is a particular uh, text editor called emacs it might not be installed in default you can install it later so even though if you have installed it you can basically uh, use it if it is minus o that means you cannot launch emacs if it is plus o then you can launch emacs so you can use the set command to stop and start particular operations so that's one of the useful examples so you can see to do that set minus o all export if i do a set plus o it shows all the set operations over here and you can see that it shows all export has become minus o that means i cannot use export <laughs> and here it's plus o okay so we've seen that now let's go and do the same commands in the operating system so if we open it i've entered the wrong password now i've entered it right okay so right now guys let's uh, do some operations so we did this hello so let me use x itself so x equal to 45 so let me echo this so it's showing the value now if you enter bash because as i told you in centos the default shell is bash and if i use bash so now i'm inside another shell so you can see that if i do an ls it's showing the content but if i do an echo it does not show the value so basically it this particular shell does not have the value for x so here i can um so let's say i'm giving 76 and if i'm doing an echo of x so it's showing 76 but you might think won't this overwrite the value of my already created x variable so to exit a bash shell it's basically exit for any shell it's exit so if i do an exit it comes out so now again if i do an echo of my I mean now it again shows 45 why it shows 45 because that particular x is equal to 76 uh, i've set the variable x as 76 in the bash which i launched recently but the variable x which was already available which i already set had the value as 45 so i did not make my my x variable global when i first created it again i did not make it global when i again created it inside the another shell so that each shells have their own values for x right now because they are local so now how to make it global so it's pretty simple i already have a variable called uh, x so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use this command export export x right now uh, sorry i don't know why i did ls but export x right now it made my x variable as global so right now i'll do a dollar x over here so you can see that my dollar x is 45 here now let me do bash and try it over here and again it shows 45 because i made my x variable global it over so basically i made my x variable global this made this particular variable's value the same in every single shell so you can launch another shell over here but still the value of x will remain the same because it is now a global variable with the same value throughout the entire system so now i'm clearing it sorry i'm exiting it so this is how you use export one more way of using export is like this export y equal to 67 so now this would have already become a global variable so other examples i wanted to show are uh, i've shown this three examples and then yeah i wanted to show set command so i'll clear this now set mm, just i'll enter set then you can see every single function you can see every single uh, variable which is set over here so you can see columns 127 uh, you can see every single value set over here mail you can see the mails uh, directory you can see you can see the old pw this was the last time i used pw and the last time when i used pw this was it so now let's try this once again let's do a new pwd and now let me type in the set command now let's go up and check the old pwd 
So now the, o, the value of old PWD should have been changed to the newly entered value of uh, newly entered value which you just entered. Going up, going up, I came to the top. So it's over here. Hmm. No login that should be here. Hmm. We saw columns, final list, and then there is gnome home. Home variable login name is IntelliPad home and I'm not able to find the old. Yeah, it's over here again. It's the previous one. I'm not able to find the variable. Okay, so that's fine. So set another option of set is um, so uh, one more thing I want to show is so you can see this. So this was one of the important commands you should know. So let's say you've done a, um, let's say alias and then not alias or so you can see I did a exclamation and I typed in just PW. So it already recognized the PW means PWD and it shows the latest uh, execution of it. So let's see EC which is echo. So it shows the execution of it. So if you have typed in a command which you don't want to type in completely again or you don't want to search it in history and again type it, you can basically put an excl exclamation and type in the first two letters of your command and it will detect and show you the latest results of it. So this is one of the things. Then coming to set, set, um, let me type in O, sorry, set plus O and now you can see all the operations over here so set plus keyboard set minus zero monitor set plus notify and all the, all of these so basically you can i can do a set minus zero and all export so now if i do another so now you can see do i've been changed to minus o so this particular option stopped this so let me try so to understand this better the set command so let's do this so there is history over here so let me type in history and it shows the complete history with the history command so let us try this minus o sorry plus o history so now let us do a plus o so i think now it would have changed history where is it history is plus o let's try history once again so it's showing the complete set of uh, everything so now let us stop it once again so basically it disables but it does not stop it from working so again you can see history the latest one so this is so now coming back to set i think to understand set you can check the manual page so if i open it it's not showing the exact command but it's showing um other things so you can see bash echo enable eval execute exit it's showing all of the commands uh in this particular bash but it's not considering set let me quit this now let us do a man for export what exactly is export so again it's not showing that it is a default command so now we've seen the export command and how to set a variable now let us see how to unset it it's pretty simple so now echo dollar x so it has a variable then use the command unset and just type in x so now let me run this again so right now we don't have a variable uh so this particular variable x does not have a value so now i have unset that variable so this is how you set it up and there is one more command env so env is for setting environment variables so if you type in env you can see the complete environment variables and you can see the uh, username is intellipad and then you can see the uh, user is intellipad again and what else so i wanted to show something relatable so that's why i wanted to show this and then there is the shell because as i told you the default shell here is bin bash uh, it is bash actually so the location of bash is under bin so that's why it is showing the shell over here so this shows the environment variables the set command basically shows the complete uh, variables inside this uh, virtual machine or this particular operating system so the set command shows the entire variables of this complete operating system but env just shows the environment variables of this particular uh, operating system so we've seen these commands so the next command is expr or expression so let's see the basic definition of it so the command expr computes a given expression and displays the output so the expr command is used to uh, 
calculate an arithmetic expression which we have provided and uh, it gives the output of it. So the below command which is expr minus minus version shows whether vxpr is installed in your system or not. Normally it will be all already installed in your system while installing any Linux distribution because expr is one of the most common commands. So uh, check it if you want to and if it is not installed then you can install it normally. And then I've checked this in the man page. So these are the operations which um, expr is capable of there are still more operations but these are the most common operations so you can see uh, argument one and then argument two then uh, so basically argument one uh, slash is basically our operation and you can see if it is either null or uh, null not zero otherwise argument two so it shows argument one if it is neither null or zero if argument one is nothing or if it is zero then it considers argument one if not it will go to argument two and then this is an and command and then argument one lesser than or argument two if argument one is lesser than argument two it will uh, give a number one if not, it'll deliver a number zero. So these are some, uh, again, some logical operations. Then coming to arithmetic operations plus uh, minus, you can see ar arithmetic sum, arithmetic difference, product, quotient, and reminder. So moving ahead, and these are some examples. So first you can see an addition, second you can see a subtraction, then multiplication, division, and you can see expr length as well. You can check the length of a string. Then you can see some logical operations which I did in the right side. Okay, so let us uh, do these in the shell. So okay, let's start off with it. So expr, let me do the first command. So I'm going to check whether expr is installed. So yeah, it is installed. It should be installed. So now expr uh, one plus two. So there should be a space in between uh, only then it works so ex otherwise it considers it as a single argument so expr 1 plus 2 it gives me this then 1 minus 2 it gives me this but one more thing you'll have to consider is while doing an operation like multiplication or subtraction you should add the backslash in front of it so let's say backslash star i'm going to multiply 1 and 2 so only if you add a star in front of it, it gives that so let me change this so now you can see it's 8. So only if you give a backslash it will work. If you don't give a backslash it will not work because the argument is wrong. So now I will do the yeah so this is division and then you can see the quotient 0 because it devices perfectly. So I'll just give a random number and give a random number here. So it's 16 so you can see the quotient also is shown and we can also divide them. It can be any big number. So it it will not show the decimal point over here so it will show you a perfect number so then we'll do some logical operations expr um, 10 equals 10 so if it is equal to then it gives 1 if it is not it so if it is not it gives a 0 then you can see the or operation also sorry uh, one more thing I wanted to show is 10 less than 11. Okay, sorry. Um, I forgot the backslash. So now you can see it's 1. So now you can see it's 10. So let me make it small. Again, it's 10. So now if I make it 0, now you can see it's 23. This, this is what this operation does. And then there is greater than. And then there is, uh, sorry. There is greater than, then there is um, greater than or equal to, and so you can see uh, this is how you can use expr. There is one more thing about expr is that you, there are some certain. So let me check the man page. So there are some certain operations which you can do using expr. So this is where I got the list of what are the operations it does. You can also you, uh, run some regular expressions in that after giving valuable names. Uh, variable names so here you can see the length and string so you can calculate the length of a particular string so now let me give a string is equal to hello so now expr length a so it shows the length of a now I'll do a dollar in front of it now it shows the length as 5 uh, so when I gave a it just calculated the length of a when I gave dollar a it calculated the length of the string which the variable a has. So this is uh, these are the basic commands which you have to remember while working with Linux. So now header file of shell script using shebang. So the name of 
the header file header part of a shell script is called shebang which is the hash and exclamation marks together so this is one of the most important things you have to know before starting off with linux because in linux you do shell scripting so for shell scripting this is one of the important things you'll have to understand so first hashtag and exclamation together so this represents which interpreter or script should be interpreted with so using this uh, shebang header you can mention what is the interpreter so normally in this particular operating system which is centos 8 so here bash is the shell so you can just type in hash uh, exclamation slash bin slash bash and then start typing your shell script so that when you run the shell script the shell will automatically understand this should be run in bash or if you put hash exclamation slash bash slash uh, csh if you type in a different shell if the shell is installed in your particular machine then it will use that shell to execute your shell script so this is how it works so the last one is uh, bin slash bash is this not provider if it it often considers bin slash sh so sh is the most basic format so normally if you do not provide the header file for a shell script it automatically considers it as a normal shell script and it uses the default shell and it uses that to execute that shell script when you put that particular uh, shell script shebang header so hash uh, exclamation slash bin slash bash in your script so that particular kernel will understand that that it should be executed in bash and it will be executed so this is the use of shebang and coming down so this is a small script the small shell script so you can see the use of the shebang over there it understands it is bash and echo this is a sample script so sh using sh or using bash there are various ways to run a particular script file i'll show that so this is the sample script okay so this is a sample script let us go to our system and run it off so okay so first you will have to create a file so i'm going to create a file nano let me just type in 1.sh i've opened the file so hash exclamation slash bin slash bash echo hello oh so this is going to be my script file i'm saving it so i've saved it so the first way of executing this is using sh second way is using bash third way is pretty simple dot slash so for this you will have to be the root user so again it's showing some error command not found so so that is the basic way of uh, doing it or you can do on one more thing um so let me do another file create another file so i'm going to type in just echo hello and saving it so now there is a 1.sh and a 2.sh file so if i do this it's showing hello even though I did not enter a shebang file because it is stored in a format called .sh and also I am running it using sh. So basically it assumes it as a shell file and it uses the shell to interpret it. So you don't need to always mention the shebang uh, header file but when there is a need, when, there is, when it is a huge shell script then I suggest you to insert it so that your particular shell script is considered as a shell script because you might uh, copy the shell script and use it in some other shell and at that time without the shell uh, header it will not know that it is a shell file so that's why you'll have to use that so uh, we'll look at various text editors vim first we'll look at vim vim is one of the most commonly used text editors and one of the most popular text editors so vim is actually lightweight and there are a lot of benefits we'll look at that later so vim is one of the most popular text editors than emacs and then gnu nano so i quite often use nano i don't use vim that much i like nano uh, better than vim and there is gedit so uh, even gedit is a quite popular text editor which is basically a gui text editor vim uh, nano or uh, the command line text editors where you can type in the terminal itself so now looking at these we'll look at the most popular text editors vim and emacs are the most popular text editors used so this is basically based on personal opinion you might prefer a particular uh, text editor for its usability so i use nano because it's pretty easy to create save and close the files and it's pretty easy to type in files also so in vim again you'll have to look at the functionality you'll have to work with it if you're fine with it then you can go ahead with vim if not you can try emacs as well so these are the two most popular text editors now this is how vim will look so vim basically is a command line tool as i told you and you can see that it just opens a window 
window where it is the command in the command line itself and it shows some things so first to start off typing you will have to enter i which is insert then you can start typing and then coming to emacs you will have to install emacs and it, when you uh, open emacs it will be opened as an application so emacs is not a command line tool it is an application so again these two are the most popular but it's still people use uh, nano gedit and still there are a lot of text editors people use all of these text editors to if it is comfortable for them so next uh, we'll look at some things about vim so vim stands for an improvised version of the vi text editor so basically vim is vi improved that's it so vi improved is vim it's the improvised version of the vi text editor which was commonly available in a lot of or uh, not even in a lot of in or every linux distribution which is available so right now why is vim popular so first it's lightweight it's easy to open it's easy to work with it and it does not take a lot of space second it's very easy to open and edit a file as i told you third if you boot a linux system vim is most possibly installed that's what i was telling you because vim is one of the most common text editors so that in most of the linux distributions so even we've installed centos i'm pretty sure in centos vim will already be installed so in most of the linux distributions vim will already be installed in it so that you don't need to go ahead and install it once again and start using it so that's why vim is popular so moving ahead these are the vim modes first is the command mode in the command mode you will not be able to type uh, but you will be able to enter commands uh, so you can see you we can enter commands for copy paste delete or replace and then in the insert mode once you press i in the command mode you your command mode will be shifted to insert mode then you can start typing in and then once it's done you can just press the escape key which will come out of the insert mode and then command line mode uh, this is also a command mode so again this is command mode but every command you provide should start with a colon so to quit it's colon q to save and quit it's colon w q so this is what happens and fourth is visual mode visually select text and run commands on selected sections to shift from command to visual type you will have to press v so once you press v you can visually select and edit things uh, like that so these are the four different uh, vim modes vim modes so you'll have to remember this so now let's create a file so just first let us look at the ppt then go ahead to our linux machine and start working with it so i've created a file and pressed i and entered some text as hello world and then pressed escape and you can see in the bottom corner colon wq and hit enter so the file would have got saved so these are some options inside the vim command mode i is for inserting capital o is insert text uh, on the previous line small o is inter insert text on the next line a is append text after the cursor capital a is append text at the end of the line so these are some options there are still many many options you can see here creating and saving a file so first let us go to the linux machine so this is my machine so i've opened it next i'll have to open the terminal and so i will first i'll make this bigger yes so right now if i type in vim so you can see vim is already installed in my system vim vi improved so that's what it's showing vim is already installed so now i get back so colon q i got back so emacs i think emacs will not be installed yeah emacs is not installed and then nano so nano is installed and i mostly prefer nano because it's uh, pretty easy for me because mostly i'm not going to edit anything i'll be typing in and then i'll save it and close it off so nano it's pretty simple it's just uh, three different uh, controls you'll have to remember to navigate vim is uh, has a lot of commands a lot of different modes you'll have to remember all that to work with it so first we'll create a file with vim so to create a file with vim first enter vim and then enter the file name so let's say one.txt so i have created the file but so now i'll not be able to so now you can see i'm able to type in but you can see there is uh, nothing over here so i'm going to press i and you can see the insert uh, word over there so this means i'm in the insert mode so in the insert mode i will be able to type so once i hit escape now i'll not be able to type i'll be given here so if i hit q what happen what will happen is it will just quit it won't save the file but if i hit wq it basically means write and quit it will save and then quit so done 
so now if you open the file once again now you can see it is created and saved now let's hit v now it's visual mode so in visual mode again you should learn some things and see i'm selecting everything and i'm able to change it accordingly so basically visual mode is to select so let's say um, select a particular text or select a particular line and then use that line on that line you can change it but in insert mode basically uh, you cannot do that in insert mode okay, you can see I'm trying to do that exact same thing so you cannot do that but in visual mode you can do that so you can see I can do that in visual mode but not in insert mode so now I'm saving it once again so if I do a tad of on.txt so this is the latest saved ones so going back to the ppt so we've done the first part we saw uh, the various uh, text editors and we also saw what is uh, vim and how to create a file and save it in vim so these are some other options we also saw the visual mode and the command mode command mode does not show the name command over there but you can type in commands like what i did colon q colon wq all those commands you can type in so ownership of linux file so when you create a file uh, basically in a linux system you have three types of uh, owners one is the user which uh, right now in my linux system it's intellipad intellipad it's a user and then there is groups groups are basically uh, you can create a group and add in some users and give them some permissions so that give that group some permission so all that users will have only those permissions and then finally others and processes so processes in the sense when a process is running that process might require a particular resource to work on a particular file to use uh, for that particular process so that process should be given permission to use that particular file so these are the three different types of owners so you can see the purpose of users and groups or for access and permissions so let's say uh, if there are no users and groups then anyone can log into your system and anyone can use any file access any file even if you are the owner anyone any like if I'm the owner of a file you can log into the system and you can change the contents of that file which is not good for me because it's my file and I want that content so for that you have users and groups so if my user logs in and creates that file only my user will be given owner permissions only I can edit that file and you cannot edit it because you're a different user now every user has their own directory uh, every user have their own directory usually with slash home slash username so under slash home you will have a directory call with your username in our particular uh, virtual machine you saw that slash home slash intellipat intellipat is the user which we created so basically this particular user has a directory under their name and then even processes need permission to access specific files and locations yes so while some processes running obviously that process will have the permission to use a particular file or log into a part or go into a particular location and access a file so these are the three different types of owners now what is the difference between a user and a group so first user owner of the file and then so these are not the differences these are basically the characteristics of users and groups so first of all, let us see the users so users again the owner of the file and then system uses user ids to manage users so let's say there are 100 different users and in that 10 people have the same name so the system will not understand that if all of them have the same name it will think they are all the same user so to differentiate between the users the system has its own identity so system has its own identity scheme which uses user ids so every user will have their own unique user id whenever that particular user is working on the system the system will uh, check for the user id and it will know who exactly is working on the system right now and then system identifies daemon processors as users so daemon processors are background processes and system will assume that a background process is running because a user has induced it uh, because mostly it is the user who is inducing it only if a uh, user switches on to the system only then those background processes will start to run so now groups groups contains two or more users so all users in the group have same permissions as given to the group so let's say you've created a group or let's uh, now not assume group so let's say now you have 10 
uh, users in that five users are database admins now all of the database admins need the same kind of permissions so instead of providing every single user the same permissions you can create a group add these five users to that particular group and give that group those permissions so once you give that group that permissions it will be applied to all the users under that particular group so that is why groups are used and then finally groups are identified by GID like how users are identified by user IDs groups are identified by group IDs now authors and processes a process can open a file and even read or write in a file yeah it can if provided with enough permissions and if a process is using a file and we delete it it does not get deleted so what is what does this sentence exactly means let me explain it to you so while you are using a uh, while a process is running and it is using a particular file so while that process is running you are basically deleting that file you would see that that file is not available in the system but the file will not be deleted it will be just deleted uh, blatantly from the top but from the memory it will not be erased only when the process is complete and the result is successful or if it is failed only when the process is complete that particular file will be deleted from the memory because if you delete that file while that process is happening and you stop that process that is not beneficial for the process as well as the user so this is what happens while a process is using a file and finally there are three types of user ids effective user ids real user ids and saved user ids so we look at these user ids in detail okay so first effective uid so an effective uid and a real user uid is basically the same once you log into the system because intellipad the user which i created and the root are the same person and the uid will be the same because i'm logged into the same system and i'm using both the super user privileges and the normal user privileges that is super user in the sense when i use a sudo su or sudo minus s to become the root and in most of the time while you're running a process effective uid is used so effective uid in the sense your normal uid of the user so the system will understand which user is exactly trying to access this particular process or which user is attempting this process using the effective uid and the real user uid comes into play only when you are shifting the user from your normal user to the root user so while you are doing that it will check for the uid it will check for whether the effective uid and the real user uid is the same or not if it is the same then it will, it will accept and move ahead because sometimes using the normally without super user privileges when you are trying to execute something it might fail and ask for the uh, it might say it does not allow because super user privileges are not provided but once you use sudo in front of it and provide the password for it it will work so how this basically works is while you're normally using it it will take the effective uid and it will assume you do not have those permissions but once you provided sudo and the password it will assume that you are root and even though you are root you will have the same uid because you're just shifting from the normal user to the root user and finally saved user uid is basically once once the system knows it's the same user and then it will be automatically saved and then when, once you hit a uh, sudo su and the password it will automatically change the user privileges so that's what save user saved user uid is the first time it might ask you that are you the same user please enter the password but once you've done that after that it will not ask it will directly ask for the password and you can move ahead so these are processes moving ahead now let's create a user and groups so that we can understand better so let me open my system so first let me log into it and okay so right now internet is not connected i don't know why i need internet but still i'll connect it uh, okay so first you can see this and so this is the user which i'm logged in right now and you can see this w it's the same thing and let me clear this okay so right now i'm logged in as intellipad so there is currently only one user because going back under home there is only one particular user which is intellipad because we've not created any other user so now what we are going to do is we are going to create another user to accompany intellipad so let's create intellipad number two intellipad two and to create that user it's pretty simple it's sudo user add username so let's go back to the terminal sudo user add and username intellipad two and enter the administrator password now it is done so now if you go back to home now you can see there are two different folders intellipad and intellipad 2 because you have created a new user so 
we've created another user right now and that's fine now let me enter into intellipad 2 for permission denied so let me do a sudo and i'm still not able to enter into it i think we'll have to log in before entering trying to enter it okay that's fine so right now our second step was to um create a group so again it's the same process to create a group sudo group add and group name i'm going to name it as uh, group one so i've created a group so you can already see there are there is a group called intellipire and there is a group called uh, wheel and we have created a group right now so uh one more thing so right now try let's try to do something let's try with file permissions we have created a user and a group this is how we create so i i just wanted to show that first now let's try one thing now going back so first let's try to cat slash etc slash shadow so permission has been denied so going to our ppt you can see here it won't work but right now with a sudo cat etc slash shadow so now you can see it has displayed all the contents under it so why i wanted to show is this is where permissions come in so you might be thinking how it happens with sudo because i've done this a lot uh, sometimes i do it normally permission will be denied but then i'll use sudo and enter the password then it will work you, you might be wondering why it is but basically it is just permissions normally a user will not have permissions to view the contents of an etc shadow folder but a super user or a root user will have the privileges to see that so that's what happened over there so now one more thing is how to get super user privileges it's pretty simple hit sudo and su or so you can see now it's not asking for the password uh, go. so exit or you can do sudo minus s so both are the same sudo seo and sudo minus s are the same so now we are logged in as the root user so now let us try so now you can see i'm able to enter the folder intellipad 2 but as the user intellipad i did not have permissions to enter intellipad 2 because it is a different user and that user has not provided me permissions to access access his folder okay now i'm the root user so now you can see I can just type in cat etc shadow and I will be provided with the result. Yeah, you can see this. So I am provided with the result. So why I am provided with the result is because I am the root user, I am the super user and I have the privileges and permissions to do this. So let me clear this and let's go back to the slides. So this is how it works. Now coming down. So now root. Let's look at the root and it is the directory at the top of the hierarchy so we have a file system hierarchy in linux and root is the top of the hierarchy because root is the first directory under root there are everything else in in a linux system root is the main directory under root there are so many directories which are for so many different operations but root is the main directory which is at the top of the hierarchy so it then has a root like structure and under it containing multiple directories and files so it is the ground level root is the ground level and under root there are so many different branches going under which forms different file structures so that is how it uh, it got the name root and this is how this is the symbol of root a slash a backslash is the symbol of root coming down so guys this is how the file structure will be so you can see this is a top folder root and under root you will see all of these major folders you can see all these major folders over here so bin etc sbin usr var dev home li lib um, mnt opt proc and root so we'll discuss them in detail right now we are understanding file permissions and right now we are looking at the file structure the file hierarchy of a linux distribution system so here we have root at the top and under root we have other subdirectories now let us look at these directories one by one first slash bin which is essential user command binaries so you can see every single command so you can see cat so you can see cat copy date echo grep hostname kill less uh, ls make directory mount move 
nano all of these commands are under bin every single command is under bin that is why we use slash bin and slash bash even bash is under bin so you can see bash so we use bash to run shell scripts and bin is one of the most important directories which is required so that you can run commands so without these commands basically you cannot do anything else in the linux system and then etc configuration files for the system you have cron tab you have the host names you have the networks you have the passwords here even the passwords are stored here even the time zones are available here the services running are available here you can see every single configuration files in uh, under the etc folder and then going to sbin essential system binaries again this is for the user binaries user command binaries this is sbin is for system binaries so you can see fdisk fsck getty halt if config reboot make swap make file system so these are all system uh, based commands so make file system uh, is for uh, let's say when you mount a particular file storage but that storage does not have a file system in it it does not support the linux file system then you can use the mkfs command to install a linux file system within that storage and then you can use reboot to reboot the system and halt to halt every processes if config to view the systems configurations and ip addresses and mac addresses so that is what sbin is and then usr basically it's user read only user applications support data and binaries <clears throat> so under usr under user you can see a bin most user commands under that you see include standard include files for c code and library obj bin lib files for coding packages these are basically for the user these are meant for the user even the man pages are under user because a user is going to look for uh, the man pages because if i don't know a command so let's say i don't know what ping is so i'll just type in man ping and the man pages are actually stored under the usr directory under usr it is stored under share under share it is stored under man so from there it will be fetched and it will be given to me so that's what static so you can see here static data shareable across all architecture so you can share this particular data across every single linux distribution and it will not uh, stop your functionality and then var variable data files you have var cache application cache data so once some application is running uh, you need this cache data uh, so without this that application will not know what exactly is happening and once you delete it it has to do the processes again and again it, it has to store that data in cache even the history command needs cache while you type in history you will be able you will be seeing all the commands which were previously executed but where will that be stored it will be stored in the cache and then you have vr lib data modified as program runs you have log you have the log files you have the opt variable data for installed packages so basically any package you install first it will be it will be uh, under the var opt package and there are temporary files as well temporary files saved between reboots so once you are rebooting there might be some files which is getting saved so that will be saved and stored in the temporary directory and once you uh, once it is rebooted it will be regained again and then there are some other important directories slash dev slash dev is basically for a device file so if i put in a a pen drive i can find that pen drive under the slash dev folder and then there is slash home so slash home is basically a uh, user home directories so that's what i was showing you the home directory which has all the user names under it and then lib slash lib is libraries so we installed kernel headers and kernel development uh, kernel devils in the start while installing uh, uh, the additional uh, the visual box additionals so those additional files require these kernel modules because kernel modules are the files which are required so that we can contact between the so we can have contact between us the shell and the kernel so that's why we need the libraries and the kernel modules and then slash mnt is basically for mounting if a new file system is getting mounted to the system you you can find it in the slash mount directory then again opt is there proc is there and finally one root is there home directory for the root user so even under root there is a folder called root under that folder you will find some subdirectories again and that particular sorry and that particular directory is for the root user and that that is the home directory for the root user so for normally for a user like intellipath the home directory is slash home but for a root user the home directory is slash root so that's what 
uh, we'll have to look at. So these, the, this is the file hierarchy in a Linux distribution. In every single Linux distribution, this is how it will uh, look. So understand this particular concept very well. So because uh, everything in Linux is a file, as I told you, slash dev slash the device name. Basically, if you enter a pen drive, again, that pen drive will consider it as a file in the Linux system. So every single entity is a file in Linux. So that's why files and file permissions are very important in Linux. We've seen a lot about file permissions, users and groups. So now let us look at these two commands, which are really uh, important and highly used commands, which is chmod and chown. Basically, it's ch modifications and ch ownership. So these commands are highly used. Now let us look at these commands. So first, modifying permissions. Ch mod is the command which you can use to modify the permission of a file or a directory. So you saw that read permissions were there, uh, then write permissions and all that. So let's say you have a file and you have written it and you have saved it. Now you don't want anybody to write inside that file. Now you can basically change your file permissions and remove the write permission from that file so that even you cannot write inside that file unknowingly so that's how you can use it and to add or remove a permission you can use plus or minus so you can see some examples in the uh, behind you can see chmod u plus x 1.txt and doing an ls minus l 1.txt basically what it did is it removed uh, or it added x over here and it removed x from both of these places and then again ch mod u minus x uh, 1 minus txt so basically this particular uh, file did not have permissions already so that's why it is showing that this place is empty and then while removing minus x that is execution it removes x from every single place of this entire permission. So rw dash rw dash r dash dash. So x was removed from every single permission that is the user permission, the group permission as well as the other or process permission. And then another way to modify permissions are providing numbers. Now numbers let's say 4 is read permission. 2 is write permission and 1 is execute permission. So here you can see R, W and uh, X. So R, so R, W and X. So the addition of R, W and X is 7. That is 4, 2 and 1, which is 7. So now coming down, so you can see here chmod 7551.txt. So now what would have, what this would have done is 7 in the sense it is 4 plus uh, 2 plus 1, which is 7. That means give all reader access give all reader access and 5 means it is 4 plus 1 then it is remove write access from group permissions and remove write access from uh, other permissions so that is what 755 means and you can see here rwx the read permissions has every single permission the uh, group permission does not have write as i said and even the other permissions does not have write as i said so now you can see here but what is 755 there was no 7 or 5 over here so now coming over here 4 plus 2 plus 1 is equal to 7 so all access is permitted so that's what happened here in the first place that is 7 then 5 which is basically 4.4 4 plus 1 is equal to 5 read and execute permissions so that's what was provided in the second and third options but we did not use 6 over here 6 basically provides read and write permissions and it does not provide execute permissions so this is one more way to change it one way is to use plus and minus, second way is to use numbers. Then ownership permission. Ownership permission is chown. So like modifying the file's permissions, we can also modify the users and groups ownership of the file and for that we must use chown. So you can see here again uh, ls minus l2.txt. So Forget about the part where we saw the file permissions. Now just concentrate on this particular part which is root and root which are basically the uh, ownership of this particular file. So 2.txt you can see the ownership was with root and root. So now I wanted permission so I used the command chown kodi 2.txt and you can see the change over here. So even as a user kodi I've got the permission to uh, use this particular file called 2.txt. So this is how you can use chown and there are some other uh, ways of doing it. So now you can see here chown username file name ownership of file for user. 
So let's say I created a file, but I want, so let's say IntelliPad created a file, the user IntelliPad, and this particular user wants to give that permissions to IntelliPad2 user. So now this particular user IntelliPad can simply provide ch own uh, IntelliPad2 and file name and the file permissions will be provided to that particular user. And then there is ch group and group name and file name. So ch group is basically changing the ownership of a group. So if you have created a group, you can use the command ch grp and group name and file name so that that group has the file permissions so let's say this 2.txt that particular file will have so every user under that group will have permissions to either access or not access that file according to the permissions provided and then see its own username colon group name file name so now both user and group at the same time so let's say you want to give uh, permissions to a user who is not in a group and also to the entire group. So now you can use this way of doing it. Uh, ch uh, own username colon group name file name. So this will give permissions to both to the user as well as the group. Now hands on ch mod and ch own. Let us do this in the console. You know, uh, let us proceed with the hands on part. So let me open my. It's just a little bit slow. Just a second. I'll just restart it. Mm, so I've restarted it. Okay, now let's get started with ch mod and ch own. I'll open the terminal then we'll execute few uh, examples of how you can use chmod and how you can use chown. Now let me first open the, yeah. so here uh, we'll do this, we'll do the chmod part first. So I'll create a file, then after creating a file, we'll change some permissions and check whether it changes or not. And then we'll change the, uh, and after that we'll use numbers to do that. And after that we'll use chmod to change the permission of a user as well as the permission of the group. So that we'll do. So now going back here, so now opening the terminal. So first let me make this bigger again. So I made it bigger. Okay. So now let's start off with it. So first let me create a file touch. So as I told you touch is just to create a file. I'm going to make it as um, hello.txt or just file1.txt. Yeah, I've created the file and there is a file so file1.txt ls minus l. So this command will show me whether it, uh, about the file permissions. So you can see it has read write permissions for users, read write permissions for the group and only read permission for processes. So the user is IntelliPad and the group is also IntelliPad. So now I'm going to use chmod to change this. So chmod u plus x. This is just for the user u plus x and file1.txt. So done. Now again lsl. So now you can see I've added the execute permissions just for the user. So now let me do one more thing. Now I'll do for G for the group. Sorry. Now let us try. Very good. Yeah. So I've added it for the group as well. So now let me add the right permissions. Sorry. Let me remove the right permissions from group. So done. So you can see I've removed the right permissions from the group, but I've provided the execute permissions. So now I want to uh, remove write and provide only read for others or processes. So for that it is O and it is going to be, I'm going to remove R and I'm going to add W. I get zero instead of O. So done. So now if I do an LS, so now you can see I've provided only W, uh, the write permissions for others or permissions, oh, sorry, others or processes. So this is what I did using chmod. So now <coughs> let's do one more thing. So now we'll give permissions using numbers. Now I'm giving 777. So what does 777 mean? 777 is basically providing every single permission to that file. So file1.txt. So now if you view it so now you can see this particular file has every single permission so let me change it to 756 so what will this do so this will basically make this one uh, it will remove the write permissions from group and this six will basically remove the execute permission from others so let me enter and again do an lsl so you can see it took off the write permissions and it took off the execute permissions now let us do one more thing so I will remove the write permission from the user. So let's say our user is uh, IntelliPad. So I'm going to remove the write permission from this file, which basically is three. Only write, uh, sorry. Uh, if I remove the write permission, it is basically uh, five, read and execute. So I'll give five, five, six is going to be the same. So now, yeah, so only read and execute is there. 
Now let me open this file and you can see it is unwritable because the user does not have permissions. Coming back, let me change this once again. I'll make this to, I'll provide write permissions as well as read and execute because they are already available. So now let me try nano again. So now I can write because I have provided the permissions to write. So this is how you can use chmod. So let me just close this. Okay. Now we've done chmod. Let's do chown. So while I'm doing this, lsl file one dot txt. Sorry. You can see Intel pad and Intel pad over here. So this is the user and this is the group. So you get it, I guess. So now let us change the group which can access this file. So the chown and the group name. So first I don't know the groups. So I'm going to grab. Uh, so I'm just going to do a cat. Uh, group. So it's IntelliPad 2, IntelliPad 3, IntelliPad. There are no other groups. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a group sudo uh, group add dev. I've created a group. So now let's try this one thing. But this time I'm not going to chat. I'm going to grab dev. So a group is all, uh, available. So we've created a group. Now we'll have to add users to this group. So I'm going to add IntelliPad. So sudo g password. So you'll have to provide this for add it's minus a then you'll have to provide the username which is going to be IntelliPad and then the uh, group name which is uh, dev so adding user IntelliPad to group dev it's added so now we can check by doing this and it is added you can see that over here so now we've created a group and added it now let us change the permission of file yeah so now let us change the permission of file one.txt so this particular group IntelliPad is going to change to group dev so to do that it's simple chown. So we saw this file name, uh, sorry, username and group name and file name. This basically, this is the syntax. We can provide the username over here, group name over here and file name over here. So right now we just want to change the group name. So for that we can either give the group name like this, dev and file1.txt. So it needs, so now it has changed. Now let us check file one once again so now you can see in the libad and dev the group name has changed so we've done that you, can, you also have another option to change that so you can use this command ch group and group name so now checking once again so now you can see the group has been changed back to in so the same way you can also change the file owner to so ch own and in two. So now let's check now you can see uh, the user has been changed to IntelliPad 2 because we changed the file ownership. So now let's do this nano file1.txt and do an ls. So you can see there are, I created a wrong file. I have to open file1.txt. So you can see it is unwritable for me because I've changed the permissions to IntelliPad 2. That is another user. So right now I don't have permissions, but so let me change it once again. Uh, sudo ch own intellipad and file name. So now if I open file one dot txt I should be able to write. Yeah because uh, I'm the user who has permissions over this file right now. So I should be able to write. So done. So ch own and ch uh, mod if these are the operations you can do with ch own and ch mod it's very helpful and I think you can use this. So let me go back to the slides display contents of a file uh, we have various ways of doing that we'll be looking at some ways of it few few different commands to do that okay so these are the four commands which i wanted to show first head first 10 lines and then tail last 10 lines grep searches for a pattern i think we've used grep uh, multiple times uh, already then cat again we've also used cat but we have not used head and tail so we'll do head and tail okay so let me go to okay so now let's see if i have any files yeah i have demo.txt first i'll do head demo.txt so you can see it's showing the first five lines but head basically shows the first 10 lines so what i'm going to do is i'm going to open demo.txt and i'm going to enter multiple lines so that it will be easy for us to debug so there are so many lines so i'm just going to make these uh, bigger lines okay so it's fine i've done it okay so now let's do head once again and you see now it shows only the top 10 lines the first 10 lines and the tail command the tail command will show the last 10 lines so you can see that as well tail command shows the last 10 commands now grep asd demo.txt so you can see grep 
is finding a pattern called ASD and it is showing all those uh, lines which has that particular pattern. So let's just type in so it again found a pattern. So that's why you use grip. And then finally we have cat. Cat basically provides the entire file. So you can see that over here. And one more few more things you can do with the tail and the header. I think in tail you can use the end command to show. So you can see it shows only the last four lines and in head again you can do that and it shows the first five lines. So basically you can use these commands to display the contents of a file as well as track them. So using grep you can see every single instance of a particular name inside a particular file which is very helpful for recognizing patterns. So that's what we did right now. So for example I'll open demo.txt once again. Uh, okay, so I've opened demo.txt. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter the username which is IntelliPad in various places. It's a wrong spelling. Okay, so I've entered in three different places. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use grep to find it, but I'm not going to use my username directly. I'm going to use a meta character dollar and a command a command called who am I which basically reads the username so grep who am I demo.txt so now you can see it is reading my username and then it is using my username to find a pattern inside demo.txt here we are using both the displaying contents for, for finding a pattern we are using grep as well as we are using the who am I command and also we are using a meta character to uh, basically read the who am I command. So if you just type in who am I, it searches for who am I. If you put the dollar command in, see, the dollar meta character in front of it, basically it means that the value of who am I, which is IntelliPad. So that's what it does. So this is how you use tail, head, grep, and uh, finally cat. You can do all these operations using all these commands. There are still a lot of commands, but these are the most basic commands. Let me get back to the slides. So we've done this. Next is copying a file, moving a file, renaming a file and deleting a file. Let's start off with copying. So I've already showed you copying and move but still we'll look at them again. First copy, copying files the command is cp, cp then source then destination or cp source to directory. So these are different ways of copying and cp source one source to source n so you, you can give a number of files and copy them to another directory. So now let's execute these copy commands. Mm, let me open it. Okay. So first, uh, let me create few files. File. What can I name them? Demo one. The txt demo. Or I'll just give demo one, demo two, demo three. So I think I've created three files. Yeah, I've created. Now I will do a nano of demo one. I'll put hello. And I've saved it. Next demo two. Mm, so I've typed in something and demo three. Same thing. I'm typing some other sentence and I've saved them. So all of these files are saved right now. So first, let us do a copy within the directory. That is copy demo one to demo four. So now do an ls. Now you can see there is a demo four file also. Before it was not existing. Now there is a demo four file. And if I do a cat of demo four. You can see the uh, text same as demo one. So next copy demo two inside desktop. Let's move it inside desktop. So I've copied it right now. You can see demo two will be available here as well as desktop. So you can see demo two over here as well. Coming back next we'll copy multiple files into another folder another directory that is first demo one demo two demo three and demo four. We'll move these three files inside downloads. Sorry, so done. So right now these files will be available here as well available in downloads as well So you can see these files are available over here. So we have done copy next We'll do the move command. So again move has the same functionalities So you can see that over here. It has the same functionalities the different command, but the same syntax So now let us move a file within the same directory that is demo 1 I'm going to move demo 1 to demo 5 so now there will not be a file named demo1 anywhere here. 
there will be only a file named demo file because I moved the contents of demo1 as well as the file itself to another file named as demo5. Next I'll move demo5 into another mm, I'll move it to desktop. So now you can see demo5 is not available here but if I open desktop I should find the file over here because desktop is over here. Next I will do one more thing coming back. Uh, we'll move multiple files so demo3 demo4 I'll move these two files into uh, documents uh, too many arguments sorry I've provided the wrong command I provided the wrong command it is move I'm done so right now demo3 and demo4 will not be here but if I go into documents they'll be available and you can see them over here so this is how you use uh, move and copy now going back now renaming a file to rename again it is the same command as move so let's see rename once again so let's say i've created a file name so no no i'm not going to create another file so let's say i have one.txt so i want to make this as uh, the word that is one dot txt one dot txt so i'm going to use move command one dot txt to one dot txt so now you can see there is a file named one dot txt but there is no file named one.txt because I renamed it. But here the process is not actually renaming the file. It's actually moving the file. But you will have to use the move command to rename the file as well. And we've seen rename as well. Now deleting. So now to delete it's uh, pretty simple. First rm. rm is the command remove. Remove and file name. Then remove and i. Then remove and star.txt. So what this does is it will delete all the .txt files then remove source 1 source 2 you can also remove by providing different file names now we'll try all this so first here you can see remove demo2 I'll remove demo2 demo2 is removed then I'll go inside documents and here there are different types of files so I will remove them by typing in demo3 demo4 and 2.txt and now I've removed these as well now here let me go inside desktop sorry and there are two files over here so i think i can delete them using this uh, rm star i no, cannot do that i think i can do this remove power and demo so it's not considering it so let's leave that okay so now let's remove these files normally first demo 2 and demo 5 no, it's not there so now what I wanted to do is so let's see there is demo.txt as well as file1.txt as well as 1.txt. So I want to remove all the text files in a single go. For that what I can do is remove star.txt and so this will basically remove all the .txt in file. So I have removed all those files. So we have uh, seen how to delete files as well. And now common commands make directory. We've done this remove directory. And then find searches a file or a directory. So let's use find find one dot sh. So it is showing that it is existing. So if I search for one dot txt, it will not exist. So let's say find. Mm, so first, let me open this. I think nothing will be here. So there is demo one. Uh, let me search for demo one, but it will not find because it's not available here. But find demo one. I think if I provide documents sorry if I provide downloads again sorry so it's finding downloads and it also shows the files under downloads so this is one command which is really useful it will show the directory as well as the sub files and sub directories of that directory and then there is pwd which we have done already then file shows the type of the file so going ahead so file downloads so it shows it's a directory now file first let me see uh, yeah uh, one dot sh so file one dot sh it's a shell script now let me create a text file and file one dot txt so it's an empty file because I have not entered anything and so that's what it means so here you can see it's born again shell script and this is a directory this is an empty file so that's how you use file unix process controls commands or linux process control commands so moving ahead you can see here uh, 
A command issued in Linux starts a new process which invokes a 5-digit unique ID called process ID or PID. Using the process ID, the process can be tracked. So let's say if you type in a command, that particular command will invoke a process. So if a process is invoked, obviously that process should have a process ID. So once it invokes that ID, using that ID, you can track that particular process. It is basically uh, reverse uh, checking it. So let's say I am trying to find out a pattern in a particular uh, uh, document or I'm trying to do an LS or I'm trying to find the um, present working directory provided here PWD. So when I type in PWD and hit enter, obviously it will uh, start a process by using uh, that process's unique ID. So once that happens, once it is called, that particular process can be tracked using the process ID. So that's what they are meaning to say here. So now initializing a process, tracking a process, stopping and other processes. So we'll look at these steps. First, initializing a process. A process can be initialized in two ways, foreground and background. So foreground, every process runs in foreground by default when it is started. So when I type in PWD, it will show you the output in the terminal. So it is a foreground process. Runs in the background, allowing other processes to run in parallel. So basically, uh, let's say in another terminal, there is another command running. And in this terminal, you can use an and in the back, which will basically push your command to the background. So now it will be a background command. So let's do this. Let me open the terminal and I will zoom it in. So ls pwd and no such file or directory. So, so pwd basically is a foreground process and pw and will become a background process. So you can see here 11215 is the process ID for this particular process. So first it invoked the process ID. So it checked whether any process is running in or already running or not. If it is already running, then it will run parallelly. If it does not, it will again execute it and show you the result. So the result is over here and it shows it's done. So this is what it means. So normally when you run any command, it will run in the foreground. Once you use an and in the end, then it will become a background. So let's do for ls, ls dollar, see sorry, ls and. So let's do this, ls and pipe pwd and. Okay, so I think I'll remove this and I'll put an and here. So you can see the second process has completed. So let us try once again ls pwd and so now you can see it first did this particular process but it did not do the second one because it took the r so now let us use and so now you can see it did both the processes that is it first did ls then it did pwd but it did it in a single go basically uh, it considered it as a single process and it executed it but it also considered it as a background process that's why it is showing the process id as well as the done mark now going ahead next tracking a process to track a process you have the command ps we look at these commands in depth in upcoming modules we are looking these right now uh, uh, like we'll be looking at these a little bit but in the few coming upcoming modules we'll be looking at these commands in depth ps and there are still top there are still more commands we'll be looking at them in depth later so right now let's just uh, go go ahead with the presentation so next all running processes can be tracked using the following commands ps so now let us try this command ps so you can see two processes are running one is bash one is ps now if i do a ps aux it will show every single process which is running so you can see that over here the root process uh, who is running the process the process id and it, this is basically an an in, in uh, sorry, this is basically an uninteractive document. It shows all the processes which I've ran, the process ID, and it shows every single thing. Even it shows PS aux as a process. So it just shows all the processes which I've run, which is running every single thing. So that's what aux means. So even PS shows the current running processes. And let's say PWD and and I'll do a PS. So right now it won't show because it has to run in synchronization only then it will show. Now going back. So this is what, what this is why you use uh, PS or it will show all the running processes. So for example, 
I can show this. So let's connect to the internet. Okay, so let me zoom this in. Now I'll ping google.com. I'll teach about the ping command in the later modules. Now just so you can see ping is running. So now let me do ps. Okay, ping. I think it does not know it's running here. So let me open another tab and do ps. So it's still not showing it. So ps ping. So I can do this. Uh, so let me close this right now. Let let ping run. I'll close this. So let me open another terminal. I'll again make it bigger. So now let me do a ps aux. So now you can see another process was running. Uh, I'll make this bigger. <clears throat> you can see every single process which ran in this particular system. And you can also see their process IDs. You can see that over here. But the current processes which are only running, only that PS will show nothing else because it's not an interactive uh, uh, command. It is basically a document. So let's leave that next moving on. Uh, next another command is there. So you can see a running process uh, can be tracked using the following commands. So you can see UID, PID, PPID, CS time terminal. Uh, time CM, CMD basically this is the command so UID is basically the user ID or the ID of the user running the process and then second is PID uh, the process ID so you can see the process ID as well PPID is the parent process ID if this particular process has a parent let's say you are running Firefox then opening 10 different tabs so it might have a process ID and then sub IDs and then C is CPU utilization of that particular uh, process so here in this case there is no CPU utilization and then S time is start time of the process when the when did this particular process start and then TTY is the terminal associated we are using only one terminal that's why it's showing PTS slash zero it's the zeroth terminal and then time is CPU time taken by the process so how long it, uh, it took basically we didn't uh, those processes did not run and it did not take much time so that's why it is showing 0000000 and finally cmd is the command of the process now uh, this is what i was showing you ps aux lists out all the running processes for all users it not just shows for this particular user it shows the running processes for every single users right now so that's what i showed you ps aux and then ps minus u username will show all the running processes for one user so this is an interesting command so we'll try this so ps aux it's minus u so i don't need aux ps minus u and intellipat okay so right now it's showing every single process running under intellipat you can see that so print to mouse, vbox client, bash, gnome terminal. So this is the terminal. So that's what it's showing. Let, uh, let me run Firefox and let's try this once again. And now you can see Firefox has also been added. So basically it is showing. So if I do PS, it only shows these two. If I see for the user, it is showing Firefox, PS, bash and gnome terminal because all of these are running currently. So, so I'll just close this. I don't require Now if I do this again. It should not show Firefox because I stopped it. So it was showing web content as well. So right now as I've closed it. So did I close it? It's the question here. No, I did not. That's why it is still showing close tabs. And so let's run it once again. So now you can see there is no Firefox because we've closed the process. So this is one way to track the process under a particular user. You can check that. And then the next one is stopping a process. So let us do this. So let's uh, again uh, run Firefox. And so you can see the process ID over here. Let me run it once again because it will show a single process ID. So I can use that process ID to kill the process and it will automatically close this particular console so now you can see Firefox this is the uh, process ID I have copied it going back so let us understand the uh, let us understand the syntax first if a process is running in the foreground that means let's say you are running ping so if you are running ping if you hit ctrl c which will which is a keyboard interrupt it will automatically stop the process for example uh, let me do a ping intellipad dot com so now if i do a control c so you can see it automatically terminated it so now this is one way of stopping a process the second way is, is to use the command kill so kill 
term signal so this is this is where you enter the signal and this is where you enter the pid so signal is what tells what exactly this particular kill command should do in order to stop a background process use the following command so coming down uh take a look at the list of terminate signals so let me give kill minus l so this shows every single signals available in your linux distribution so you can check it over here sig hub sig end sig buzz and then there should be a sig abort sig kill is there sig alarm is there sig stop is there so all of these are different signals we'll be learning about signals as well in the further modules and then there is a cat and command so example stop the cat command running in background by so we'll do this example we'll run the cat command in the background so once we have run the cat command in the background, then we will kill this process using its process ID. So that's what we are going to do. And so let's go ahead and do this. So I'll close this. I will open another window. I will run the cat command. It automatically stopped. I'll just copy this. So now P uh, sorry, kill. And I think we should use the number nine minus nine. So minus nine is basically terminate the process abruptly. It will kill the process abruptly and minus nine so it was already stopped so it killed the process so you can see right now there are two processes so one is uh, let this run we'll close that as well let me do this ping telepat.com so let this run let us do a ps right now it's not showing but we have the uh, ip so i'll just copy this still running so let's minus nine and the id i think this is the id let me check once again I've pasted it so I think it would have killed the process so yeah the process stopped so basically it killed it so now let us do the same thing with Mozilla so now first I'll do psox and you can see every single process running and for Firefox you can see here and Firefox Firefox content pro Firefox content pro so I'm going to just stop this particular I'm going to kill this so kill minus 9 which is for terminating or sig, uh, sig abort so this will basically so, sorry it is sig kill this will basically kill the process so kill minus 9 and i'm pasting it and you you saw the mozilla window dis, uh, disappeared from behind basically it killed the process so let me do a psox once again so now you cannot see the uh, firefox uh, process running because i have killed it so this is how you can use the kill command to kill the process. So we did that particular example. We used Mozilla and we saw how to kill a process. Right now we saw up till uh, PS, the command PS. Now we look at top and few more commands. So first top. So the following command is used to see all the running processes within the working environment of Linux. Basically this is an interactive uh, shell. Uh, you can see the processes changing in real time. So if a process is killed, you can see that in real time. If a process is uh, invoked, you can see that in real time. You can use the top command for that. So we'll do them one by one. Now let us just see what are the commands available. Sorry. So next we have nice. So you can see the following command is used to start a process and assign it a priority value at the same time. So nice um, hyphen nice value and process. So nice value ranges from minus 20 to 19 where minus 20 is of the highest priority. So you can see cat and it started the process in the background and then PS minus L uh, it was showing all the uh, running processes and you can see priority is 80 nice value is zero default priority is 80. And the command is cat so you can see all the priority values over here and you can see uh, cat is stopped over here coming down you can see nice minus 19 cat and so basically what this will do uh, as, we, as we told you uh, minus 20 is the highest priority so minus 19 obviously will be the highest priority right now so you can see the priority has changed from 80 so here you can see the priority has changed from 80 to 99 nice value is 19 priority is reduced to 99 and this is again cat and nice 19 cat it stopped again so and again one more is nice hyphen minus minus 19 command so nice hyphen hyphen 19 cat and so again it started the cat it started running cat nice value is minus 19 and priority is increased to 61 so that you can see over here so this is what minus 19 does so if you just provide hyphen 19 or hyphen any value it does not considered is as so, so it does not considered 
considered is a, it as a minus 20 value it basically considered it as a positive value we'll have to provide two hyphens only then it will consider it as a minus value which means it increases the priority of that so this is 99 and this is 61 basically which means this has increased the priority so now one more command is renice you can see the following command is used to change the priority of a process so while that particular process is running you can change the priority of that particular process so renice again the same hyphen nice value then process id so let's say a process is started with a the nice value of minus 10 nice minus 10 cat and so nice minus 10 cat and so that's what uh, they're doing here nice minus minus 10 cat and so this is the process priority is at 70 ni is uh, minus 10 coming down now using green eyes minus 3 and the process id basically they change the value automatically so you can see it got changed old priority was minus 10 new priority is minus 3 so 77 minus 3 and that's what uh, they are telling here so but what do you mean by priority why do you need priority so let's say if a process is having the highest priority cpu will provide the maximum time for that process to complete but if you provided that particular process the lowest priority of 19 then that process will not be given the same priority as a process which has minus 20 or some value nearby that so that is why you need priority so now and then one more command is df this command basically lists the block devices available and their disk space so you can see these are the file systems so now let us start off with the first command and look at all these commands and let us finish off with this particular module so let me open my done i've opened it so let's start off with the first command which is top so as you can see uh top command is running and you can see the values are being changed top uh gnome shell gnome terminal so let me open another window and let me run ping intellipad.com so i'm pinging right now so uh there should be a new process created called ping so i think it just went and it went back mm, right now it's showing the top processes over here uh so where is that so let me stop this and run once again i think you would see the changes going on here okay let's stop this now let me become the super user and run a command in the background so let me run cat and so cat is running in the background so right now it should show a cat uh command if it has enough cpu memory so you can see here pid priority is 20 minus 51 then ni it has these processes have the highest priority because they are minus uh, 20 and then what else you can see the number uh, the time which uh, these processes are running and you can see the memory which this particular processes are taking the shell is taking 11.5 percent of the memory and 19.4 percent of the cpu at this particular time top command is taking 1.7 percent the gnome terminal is taking uh 1.7 percent of memory and one percent of uh, right now it's saying three percent of the cpu so you can see this is an interactive way of looking at it and you can see the number of tasks running 230 uh, 230 total tasks two are running uh, three are running 225 are sleeping two are stopped and the memory uh, 2837 three memories 637 used is 1073 and available memory is 1080 so you can see uh the real time changes in the cpu memory available and not available so let me now stop this kill minus nine one two eight two one so i've stopped it so the cat command should stop and the available memory you saw it had a slight increase because one uh, particular background process stopped and that gave the memory a little space so this is how top works now let me close this and so we saw top next we'll have to see nice so uh going back here so nice and the value so first let us run cat in the background and then let us do the same process over here so i'm just going to open this terminal i'm already logged in as the root and sudo sorry i'm already the root so i'm going to run a process minus 19 cat and so now i'm going to do a ps minus l and now you can see the cat process running which is minus 19 19 and 19 so first let me uh, stop kill few processes uh, no sorry i should not kill it now i'm going to do the same thing but i'm going to use minus minus 19 cat and and ps minus l so now you can see there is a fourth cat process which is running 
uh, with a different PID, but the parent process ID is the same because I told you all uh, similar processes will have the same parent process ID, but will have a different uh, process ID. So first, let us kill them. One three one five two done. One three one seven five done. One three one seven seven done. So right now only one seven eight is running. So so the one one uh, sorry one three zero eight six process is running so let this run so right now what i'm going to do is i'm going to renice this process so that's what we'll have to do that is uh, renice. we did both of these commands we've changed this particular uh, uh, value so now we'll use renice that is uh, you can see renice minus three and the process id so i'll put renice so i'm changing the niceness basically i'm changing the priority so that the cpu will give uh, memory and time accordingly so renice i'm going to give minus six and i'm going to give the process id process id is one three one uh zero sorry it's zero eight six so enter so now the sh it's showing old priority is 19 and new priority is minus six if you do a psl again you can see uh, you can see now the process id has changed and the priority has increased to 74 so this is how you use renice and then finally there is a df command so let me clear this and hit df so now you can see there's a slash dev which is mounted it is completely available because no other dev uh, device is attached then there is slash run then there is slash boot so boot is the directory which is used for booting the system to uh, basically to start the system without the uh, boot directory you cannot start the system and there is run user 42 and thousand so thousand is the user id of intellipad user so that's what and there is a fourth one for the guest editions so the guest editions is running and the use is 100 percent this particular uh, directory is used 100 percent because it's running all the time so this is how you can view the mounted devices the device files as well as the storage which is used by them and the storage which is available and you can see the mounted location also so this is root so you can see in the root uh, so this is the root and you can see it's mounted to the root folder and 11% of this particular uh, root folders uh, Space is used and you can see the available storage and the used storage So this is how you can view it. So now we viewed all kinds of processes going back So we've completed this module guys. So thank you meet you in the next module So let me just recap the last part. We saw the ps command. We saw uh, the ps aux command which lists every single process but top is the same kind of a process but top will show that interactively ps aux will show just the processes which have already uh, which are running uh, when that particular command is uh, uh, typed in once that command is typed in and you've got the result after that if there is a new process it will not show but the top command will show that so top is an interactive uh, running uh, to show the running processes it's an interactive command but ps is not and then nice and renice are commands for changing the priority your processes so it will decide how much priority should the cpu should give to this particular process so according to the nice value and the renice values so renice is to change the nice values so the highest priority is minus 20 the lowest is 19 so accordingly it will prioritize the processes and run them accordingly it will give the maximum memory and time to the processes which have the highest priority to complete them first so that's why you can renice your processes if they do not have high priority or if they have high priority and then we also saw this command which is kill uh, we use the kill command by using minus nine and the process id we can stop that particular process completely and using and at the end you can basically uh, run a process in the background so that we saw and it only works if you are logged in as sorry not logged in if you are in, as a super user only then you can run the background process otherwise you cannot do that it will automatically stop itself and then you can also use Control c which is basically an interrupt keyboard interrupt that will also stop it and then yeah so this is what we saw in this particular module okay guys a quick info if you want to do an end-to-end -end linux training IntelliPad provides a complete Linux certification training and those details are available in the description. Okay guys, we've come to the end of this session. I hope this session was helpful and informative. If you have queries regarding this session, please leave a comment below and we'll love to help you out. Thank you.